In this video I'm going to talk about the challenges of 802.11n and compare how the microcell and channel blanket architectures deal with those challenges. First I'll talk about the potential of 802.11n and in particular I'll describe the main new features that 802.11n brings to wireless LAN. Then I'll talk in detail about the challenges that 802.11 poses, in particular the challenges posed by channel bonding on both the 2.4 GHz band and on the 5 GHz band, the severe throughput sensitivity of 802.11n to legacy devices, cell planning challenges that come into play when one wants to implement 802.11n, rate versus range issues, MIMO issues, and also um, a bit about roaming, and then we'll sum up. The features that make up 802.11n can basically be divided into physical layer improvements and MAC layer improvements. The first physical layer improvement that 802.11n brings to the table are higher modulation rates, which raises the maximum error rate from the 54 megabits per second maximum of 802.11a and 802.11g to 58.5 megabits per second. Now it's important to point out that we are talking here about error rates and throughout this video, unless indicated otherwise, we're going to talk about error rates. Now the error rate is the raw wireless LAN throughput. UDP and TCP throughput is a lot less than the error rate due to the amount of signaling that takes place in wireless LAN communications. So for example, an error rate of 300 megabits per second can yield a TCP throughput of anywhere from approximately 150 megabits per second to 180 megabits per second, um, depending on the manufacturer. So just keep in mind that the actual TCP throughput you will get from your network will be a lot less than the error rate. Moving forward, um, there are a number of other physical layer improvements uh, that 802.11n brings to the table. FEC, improved forward error correction, um, brings us from 58.5 megabits per second to 65 megabits per second. Short guard interval moves 65 megabits per second up to 72.2 megabits per second. Channel bonding raises the uh, potential error rate from 72.2 megabits per second to 150 megabits per second. And MIMO has also a very, very significant uh, impact, um, raising the error rate from 150 megabits per second to 300 megabits per second. And in uh, later phases of 802.11n, um, we're going to be seeing error rates of 600 megabits per second. The other physical layer improvement is maximal ratio combining, or MRC. MAC layer improvements are also quite significant. Uh, frame aggregation um, has a very, very significant impact on uh, throughput. Uh, block acknowledgement is another important MAC layer improvement, uh, as well as new power saving modes. So taking a look at the list, or taking a step back from the list, it's pretty clear that the in the physical layer improvements, the, the two most um, impacting improvements are channel bonding, which doubles the throughput, and MIMO, which also doubles the throughput. Um, so we're going to focus uh, a lot in our discussion on uh, both uh, channel bonding and on uh, MIMO. So now let's talk about the challenges of 802.11n. As I mentioned, one of the, the main issues in getting the most out of 802.11n is channel bonding. Um, and it's also one of the main challenges. That's because while channel bonding brings tremendous performance benefits, it also brings some implementation challenges. Full performance N, i.e. the 300 megabit per second error rate I mentioned earlier, requires combining two 20 megahertz channels into one 40 megahertz wide channel. That's what channel bonding is. The problem is that at 2.4 gigahertz, if we implement channel bonding, instead of three non-overlapping channels, one, six, and 11, we are left with two non-overlapping channels, 
channels 1 plus 6, which is our 40 megahertz channel, and channel 11, which is our remaining 20 megahertz channel. Now let's take a look at what that would imply for a microcell deployment. Now this is a typical microcell deployment at 2.4 gigahertz with three distinct 20 megahertz channels. Now if we do channel bonding, now we have cells running on the same channel adjacent to each other. As you can see, we have two types of cells, the 1 plus 6 channel cells and the channel 11 cells. And they're, they're adjacent all the way through our implementation. So co-channel interference, which is bad enough with three channels, would be even worse with only two. In fact, this kind of deployment simply would not work. So clearly a microcell deployment in the 2.4 gigahertz band cannot use channel bonding. The only option for 802.11n would be to use standard 20 megahertz channels, which would mean that error rates would be half of what they could be. In other words, only half of the potential of 802.11n would be realized in this situation. And actually it would be even worse because, as we will see later, in a microcell deployment, the 2.4 gigahertz band needs to support legacy clients, which will drag the bandwidth down even more. So now, can we use channel bonding in a channel blanket architecture? The answer is a definite yes. Instead of three non-interfering channel blankets in the 2.4 gigahertz band, there will be two non-interfering channel blankets as shown in the next slide. The 40 megahertz channel, channels 1 plus 6, is one channel blanket and the remaining channel 11 forms a second channel blanket. Since there is no need to sell plan, having only two 2.4 gigahertz channels doesn't present any planning problems. Co-channel interference is still zero. Now let's talk about a very big bonus here. Because each channel blanket is a separate SSID, the ExtraCom wireless LAN can be set up so that legacy users are allowed to connect only to the blue blanket. The gray blanket, which is our 40 megahertz blanket, effectively becomes a pure end blanket. That enables a throughput gain that could easily reach 700% over what would happen if legacy users were allowed to access the end blanket. By the way, the 802.11 N standards committee realized this impact also and gave a special name to a pure end blanket which is called HT mode and HT stands for high throughput. HT mode knock, locks out legacy users from accessing the 802.11 N BSSID. Now if you're surprised by the drastic impact of legacy users on an 802.11 N implementation, take a look at the pie chart in this slide. The pie chart shows how airtime is utilized in a case where all clients need to transfer the same data, data and when there is an equal presence of N, B, and G clients. The N clients get only 2% of the airtime. Even if there are no B clients, N airtime only rises to 10%. So it's clear that running 802.11n without legacy clients in a, what we call HT mode is the only real alternative to take reasonable advantage of 802.11n's bandwidth. Otherwise, the potential of 802.11n is simply nullified. By the way, creating a pure end blanket is very easy to implement on the channel blanket architecture, as you can see from the switch configuration GUI in this slide. Um, in this shot, Radio 2 is running a 40 megahertz channel blanket in the 2.4 gigahertz band in 802.11n HT mode. And Radio 2 is the, um, is the column that's circled in green. And you can see also below that uh, HT mode has been activated. By the way, um, Radio 3 uses the remaining 2.4 gigahertz spectrum to provide a 20 megahertz channel blanket for legacy BG users. Now just to talk about the 5 gigahertz band for a few seconds, Radio 1 is running another blanket in 802.11 HT mode, and Radio 4, which is partly shown at the right side of the screen, is running a blanket for legacy 802.11a clients. Uh, but we'll talk more about 5 gigahertz operation later.